As someone who's successfully founded multiple businesses, I cannot overstate how important it is to have a single source of truth for your business, for inventory, for revenue, and on and on. There's an amazing tool called NetSuite that can help you do just that. Visit netsuite.com slash SPI to download their KPI checklist for free and support this podcast. If you do find yourself buried in manual work or struggling to have a clear picture of your business, you should know three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. Number 25, well, NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. And the number one, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. And right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash SPI. That's netsuite.com slash SPI to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash SPI. There was once a time when building a website was a massive undertaking and a huge pain, something that you would need to clear your entire schedule for. Well, guess what? Those days are over, and now you can build a professional, sparkling website in just seconds, thanks to Hostinger. In fact, I recently did this, and I shared the process on my YouTube channel, and it was absolutely mind-blowing, especially considering it took like days on end previously when I first started building websites. This tool is amazing, and I was using AI to do it. So Hostinger is a top highly rated global web hosting and website creation brand, right? And all you have to do to build a website is answer three questions. Here it is. You enter your brand name, you select the website type, you describe your business, and then you can customize it further with a drag and drop editor. It's literally that simple. I just went through this process. I promise you it is the easiest way to build a website. And it also offers some AI-driven SEO-friendly copy, an AI logo maker. Plus, they make all this super affordable. It's less than $3 a month, including a free domain name. So create a live website now at hostinger.com slash SPI. And listeners of this podcast can enter SPI for 10% off your order and a free domain name. H-O-S-T-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash SPI. And use the code SPI for 10% off and a free domain name. It's incredible. Now back to the show. So you just hit play on this podcast episode and you're probably wondering whether or not it's one that you should continue to listen to. Well, our special guest today kind of summed it up for you here. If you interact with other human beings, this could be useful for you. All right, enough said. Cue the music. Welcome to the Smart Passive Income Podcast, where it's all about working hard now so you can sit back and reap the benefits later. And now your host, He says the most important time of the day is family time. Pat Flynn. Want to stop grinding through resumes and just meet your match already? Well, you can with Indeed. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. It's your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, plus their matching engine helps you find quality candidates fast. And it works like really fast. In fact, by the time this ad's over, 23 new hires will have been made on Indeed, according to Indeed data worldwide. It's the perfect match of speed and quality. 93% of employers agree Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites. And I think Indeed is the place to go. It's easy to manage. Everything is in just one spot. The interview process, it's scalable with you and your business as it grows. Like there's no other platform you would need than Indeed. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored ad job credit to get your jobs and more visibility at indeed.com slash smart passive. Just go to indeed.com slash smart passive right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash smart passive. Terms and conditions apply. You need to hire, you need Indeed. If you're at a desk a lot like I am, it is really important to move around and increase the circulation as much as possible. And a sit slash stand desk can be a massive game changer. If you haven't tried one before, this offer from Uplift is for you. Plus, you can support the show at the same time. Visit upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. Uplift Desk is the place to go. There are so many customization options, plus free 30-day returns, free shipping, free accessories with every desk. And did I mention the industry-leading 15-year warranty? It's no wonder they've been wire cutters pick for six years in a row. Plus, they offer a great range of ergonomic chairs and storage systems if you want to give your whole workspace a makeover. They even have an augmented reality feature so you can see what your new desk will look like in your space using your phone. I mean, they even make a height-adjustable conference table that doubles as a regulation-sized ping-pong table. These folks have really thought of it all. 
And if you want to build the workstation of your dreams, I highly recommend checking them out. Just go to upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. That's U-P-L-I-F-T desk.com slash SPI to get 5% off your entire order. All right, thank you for joining me today in session 325 of the Smart Passive Income podcast. Who was that in the beginning? That was Michael Bungay Stanier, who is the author of a book, The Coaching Habit, Say Less, Ask More, and Change the Way You Lead Forever. This was my choice for top business book of 2017. I even did a YouTube video about this that was very popular, and I'm so thankful I had the opportunity to have Michael come on the show today. We'll get to him in just a second, but I want to talk more about this idea of coaching. We're all coaches. If you tell anybody how to do anything, you're a coach. If you are helping any other people in any sort of way, you are a coach. But here's the trick. You're not actually supposed to tell anybody what to do to be a great coach. Great coaches listen and ask the right questions. And I have directly applied the lessons from this book into not just the Ask Pat show and even not just into podcast interviews I do here so that I can ask the right questions, but in my daily life with my kids, with my wife, with other people I interact with, when I'm doing market research, when I am creating products, when I'm talking to my students, when I'm coaching my accelerator students, all those things. And I'm gonna say it straight away. This is probably the most useful book I've ever read. And so we're gonna dive into a lot of the principles of this book today. I also have some follow-up questions based on my implementation of what I've learned in this book to get some clarity from Michael here. And not only that, if you stick around to the end, I'm gonna tell you how you can get a signed copy of his book, The Coaching Habit, for free. Happy to send it your way if you're one of the 10 people selected. So make sure you stick around to the end because I definitely am excited about that giveaway. So let's not wait any further. Here he is, Michael Bungay Stanier from thecoachinghabit.com and author of the Wall Street Journal bestseller, The Coaching Habit. Michael, thank you so much for being here on the Smart Passive Income Podcast. Uh, it's a, such a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. You That video you did where you're like, we're going to make this book the book of the year, it was a cool moment for me. It was really <laughs> thrilling. So thank you. I'm excited that we've kind of culminated in having this chat now. So thanks. Yeah, no, abs- absolutely. This, I feel, is going to be one of the most important episodes of the podcast which is saying a lot because we've had you know over 300 episodes and a lot of people have gotten a lot of value out of them. But the reason why I'm saying that is because your book, The Coaching Habit, Say Less, Ask More, and Change the Way You Lead Forever has been a huge game changer for me in how I've been able to help others. And people are actually listening to my other show, Ask Pat, where I actually apply exactly what you teach in an actual coaching session that people can listen in. So if you guys, if you guys wanna get a feel for after this, kind of how The Coaching Habit applies to coaching, uh, you can actually hear me do some of the things. But again, the reason why this is so important is because my goal is to help as many people as possible. And just the way you easily lay out how a coach should be uh, mm. and, and should should chat with people and get a person to discover what to do next, it's just it just makes complete sense. And I mean, there's no surprise that there's over a thousand uh, you know customer reviews. And correct me if I'm wrong, Michael. This is a self published book. It is. There's a good story behind it. Which, tell I mean, tell me spent, about it. Well, yeah, I spent three years. Um, so it's my fifth book. So I've done I've done a couple of self published ones. I did one with Seth Godin when Seth had his year of publishing books, and we did a philanthropic book that raised four hundred grand for charity, which was also cool. But um, I actually got a book published by you know a fancy New York publisher called the book's called Do More Great Work, and uh, I then spent three years pitching this book to them, and they just couldn't get there they just didn't like it wow um and to be fair i probably pitched them substantially substandard versions of the book that ended up showing up but Mm -hmm. yeah i I effectively wrote four or five complete bad versions of this book before finally getting to a point where i'm like okay this is killing me and kind of laid it on the table i said okay look Either it's this book as I'm seeing it now and you, it's a yes or a no from you. I mean, at this stage, <laughs> I can't keep this in the twilight experience going. No. Um, and they were like, it's a no. And honestly, I was gutted, Pat, because, you know, my previous book sold, you know, about 100,000 copies with them. So it was a solid, solid selling book. Um, and I was like, oh, why wouldn't you bet on the person with the vision? And I've got a little bit of marketing now, so I think we could make this happen. But mm-hmm. They said no, and so I was like, okay, self-publishing. But 
because self-publishing is so available to so many people, I had a really clear commitment that I was going to publish this as if I was a professional. So really being distinct in my own mind about the difference between an amateur and a professional about how to approach this. So I paid for somebody to help me with thinking about distribution and project management. And I paid a really great designer and I paid a really great editor and then a proof editor. So we, we laid out money to make this work. But yeah, it's been self-published and um, it's it's one of the one of the moments of pleasure for me was uh, being interviewed by Michael Hyatt, which some people will probably know. Yes. Um, and he used to be CEO of a publishing company, and he was talking to me about the book, and I, was like, and I mentioned in passing it was self-published, and he was stunned. And I was like, nailed it, because if I can fool an ex-CEO of a publishing <laughs> company, I can fool most people. Yeah, he was over at Thomas Nelson, and uh, Michael's right. a good friend of mine, but um, – I'm imagining that when these publishers were like, no, this isn't good, did you at ever at any point consider, you know, well, maybe this isn't a book that should be published? What made you go, no, this has to be published. I'm going to do it myself. It's that important. And that's a great insight because you sort of have to get to that point, which is like, this is worth <laughs> this is worth doing regardless. Right. Um, I did have moments going, ah, well, maybe this isn't a good book. Um, or maybe this isn't the right book, but it was partly it was an idea that I couldn't let go of. It kept coming back, going, "No, I insist that this this some version of this book get written." And the other thing for me, Pat, is you know I get asked a lot of times you know, by people, I, mean, I, "I should write a book," and I will always say to people who go, "No, no, I need to write a book." I go, "Do you really need to write a book?" Because it is a for the most part, a long, miserable, and unsuccessful experience. I mean, it's hard to write a book. Um, you, you, you know, you write this first draft, and it's a bit crappy. <laughs> and, it, and you're like, but oh, it's okay, I've got a first draft down, so here we go. And then you write a second draft, and it's actually worse. And then finally you get to, like, the fifth draft, and it's actually getting good. But at this stage, you're filled with self-loathing for yourself and the <laughs> book. And, and ah. And then finally, after a year at least of writing this, you get the book out into the world and you're exhausted but exhilarated and then nobody buys it because that's the truth of most books is most people don't buy most books. Um, you know, the number I've heard is 93% of books sell less than a thousand copies. So with that reality, it's a really great question to always be asking yourself, look, it's great to have something to get out into the world. That's important. But is a book the best channel for doing that? And for me, it was because I knew that this book, if I sold zero through Amazon or through wherever, I was like, A, this is a tool I can use marketing my business because my business is a, a training company that teaches managers and leaders to be more coach-like. So I was like, this will help me have credibility in selling that to you know, VPs of HR, which are my kind of key customer. And also, this is a tool that I can add to my training program so it becomes collateral. So I could see that even without it selling, I can make this book an in in integral part of my business. So I had a back end and I had a plan that went beyond just the can this book get out into the world. I love that. And you, you, you had mentioned that, you know, it's kind of for managers and VPs of HR, and that's kind of your primary target. But I mean, who can make use of this book well honestly my 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 slightly glib but not really answer is if you interact with other human beings this could be useful for you because to, to your point before you said this is kind of lays out what you need to do to be a coach but in fact for us we're not trying to turn anybody into a coach because there are a lot of coaches out there already. What we think is useful for everybody is to be a bit more coach-like in the conversations you're having. So this is if you've got a parent or a kid or a peer, just everybody. And the basic behavior change that we're looking for, Pat, is can you stay curious a little bit longer? Can you rush to action and advice giving just a little bit more slowly? That's our very behavior-based definition of being more coach-like. And, of course, most people are advice-giving maniacs. Like mm -hmm. somebody starts talking to you and after about 30 seconds, even though you have no idea of what's really going on, of the complexities of the situation, of the people involved, after you know, 30 seconds you're like, I'm desperate to tell you what to do. And – 
there's always a place for good advice. But if you can just take a little more time to get to that advice and have the other person figure stuff out for themselves, it's a much more powerful conversation actually for both sides of the equation. Why do you think we're so quick to just give advice versus actually digging deeper to figure out what the best advice might be? Well, I think there's probably a bunch of things at play here. One is most of us have a good heart and we're trying to be helpful. So there's just that sense of this is actually my goal is to help you. Then there's the um, the expectation that the way you get rewarded in life is by having the answer. <laughs> so you know, we spend our whole training through school, through university, through our early career, striving to figure out what the answers are and being that subject matter expert. So, you know, lots of us have been going, I mean, I've been striving to get the A by knowing the answer. So there's that, which is this is how you... Um, this is how you know you're doing well, is you've got the answer. Then there's the fact that because of that, we all have deep habits so that we're just really experienced and practiced in when a situation occurs and somebody goes, blah, 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 your response is to offer up advice. But then at the kind of more subtle level, I think there's a reason that we like to give advice because it's the power position in the relationship. Because when you are giving advice, even when you start to realize, and this is kind of the shift that sometimes happens with people who read the book, that they go, well, first of all, half the time, if not more, I'm solving the wrong problem. And then when I realize that my advice actually isn't nearly as good as I think it is, I'm now realize that I'm offering up slightly crappy advice to solve the wrong problem. (laughs) And that's not that helpful for anybody. But the thing is, even if that's happening, it feels a better place because you feel like you're the smart one, you feel that you're in control of the conversation, you have high status during this conversation. And when you shift that and and change your behavior in the way that, for instance, you've done that, Pat, what you're stepping into is a place of, if you like, servant leadership. Because when you ask a question rather than give advice, you step into a place of more ambiguity, and more uncertainty and more risk because you know you ask a question then you have that moment where you go was that a good question was that the right question do they understand the question uh what if they come back with an answer that i don't understand or that's crazy where's this conversation going i've lost control of this conversation but what's happening is empowerment and of course everybody nods their head to empowerment and go yeah i'm, I'm for empowerment but Empowerment happens when you actually give up some control and hand it to the other person. And that is quite a fundamental shift. So I would say that that's the the kind of below the waterline reason that people love to give advice. But there's all these other reasons uh, around that that also contribute. I think a big worry for me with starting with asking questions first instead of giving advice is I feel that the person who's asking me for help is looking for an answer right now. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I'm trying to help out and give it to them. I'm worried that if I ask questions, they might consider, well, shouldn't you know the answer to these questions? <laughs> right. Yeah. And then it gets worse if you follow some of the, the, uh, the suggestions in the book where you're like, you actually don't need even very many questions. Like just a few good questions that you repeat can actually do the work for you. But then you're like, oh, my God, I'm just asking four questions over and over again. Aren't they going to cotton on that I've got nothing to yeah. add here? Right. So that anxiety is totally natural. Um, and I would say this. Look, here's a classic case. Somebody comes up to you and goes, hey, Pat. How do I, you know, you're in a position where, you know, you've built a a brand and authority around your ability to help people and have answers. So you're going to get this all the time. Hey, Pat, how do I? And that triggers every part of your body, your advice monster, if you like, to come out and go, let me tell you what I think you should do. But here's the habit that I've developed that might be useful for you or, or people listening in. And it gives both of you what you want. So when somebody comes up to me and goes, hey, Michael, how do I? I go, look, Pat, that's a great question, and I've got some ideas on how to tackle this, and I'll I'll share them with you. But before I give you my idea, what's your first idea on how to tackle this? And they'll give me an answer, and I'm like, fantastic, I love that. And then, of course, I use the best coaching question in the world, and what else? Go, what else could you do? And what else could you do? Great, and is there anything else you could do? And then, if it's appropriate, I'll then go, so I love all of these ideas. Here's what they make me think of, and I might add one or two ideas of my own. 
So what I'm doing here is a number of things. I'm making sure they know that I've got their back and I'm not going to let them leave with, without helping them answer the question. But secondly, I'm giving them first go so that I'm not just offering up advice that they already know. I'm like, tell me what you already know. Tell me what you've already thought of. And then thirdly, I get to just offer the more exquisite advice because it's more precise. It's not redundant. And if you want to play a game with this, it's kind of, I'm kind of reminding them that actually I'm still the smartest person in this conversation because, you know, I had all those other ideas that you had. Plus, I've got a couple more that can be helpful there as well. Oh, wow. You know, you'd mentioned that best question to ask, which is and what else, which Mm -hmm. you teach in the book is like you have to ask this question because often the answers you get back aren't the real answers that you're looking for. And I'd love to know, like, why does that simple question work so well? I'm. On the other hand, why aren't people giving you the real answer first? Well, I, um, I, 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 for the most part, I don't think people are kind of going, I'm just going to hold back the real answer here and see if I can blow you off with a, 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 <laughs> another one. I just think that for most people, the first answer is never their only answer, and it's really their best answer. But because of our drive for action and the need to kind of get things going, we all get seduced into thinking that the first answer is the only answer and the best answer. Mm -hmm. So I just think what you're doing is you're just creating a tiny bit more space to actually go, tell me what's in your head, as opposed to we've got to hustle this on. And of course, the other reason and what else works well is it's a self-management tool. Because so often you, the the asker of the question, is the person who hustles the conversation along. And, you know, we, we you heard that definition of coaching or being more coach-like, which is staying curious a little bit longer, rushing to action and advice giving just a little bit more slowly. Well, and what else is a self-management tool to tame your advice monster you know that's the thing we're doing we've all got that advice monster as soon as they start talking it comes up out of the dark going i'm going to add value to this conversation right away and we're just trying to tame that calm it down a bit and and what else is a tool for that that's a great question to ask for all you podcasters out there too because oftentimes we're asking questions in interviews and we get we we just get kind of surface level answer i think it's just natural Mm -hmm. to do that and it's it's interesting when i started practicing and what else It felt awkward to ask that question because it made me assume that like, well, I mean, I know you're holding back. Give it to me. (laughs) Only one person had ever said, well, you know, that's it. Every other person I've asked has been, you know, and there's this other thing. And that's usually where I then go down, which is it's just such a cool trick. Um, And, And what's cool is even the person who goes, well, that's it. There's nothing else. That doesn't mean that that conversation is now a failure. It just means that you've tapped it out. And you're like, well, okay, if, that, if there's nothing else, let me ask you another question. So what's the real challenge here or, or whatever it might be? Um, but I love your point, which is, you know, you've got now a bunch of data that says there's almost always, there's almost always more there. <laughs> and it's not even though you're like, you're tricking them. You're just staying curious about give me a deeper, richer, more complex answer. That's going to be more interesting for me. It's going to be more interesting for you as well. And obviously, everybody, I want you to go and check out The Coaching Habit. And make sure you stick around to the end because we're going to do some special giveaway uh, mm-hmm. to, get, to get some signed copies of the book as well. So I'll tell you how to get those in, in, uh, at the end of the show. But let's dig deeper into some of these other questions. Um, and to me, when I was reading the book, I'm like, man, it's sort of like the, it, the order of the questions are so important too. Like when I was considering coaching a while back, I always thought, okay, like I know I have to ask questions. First question should always be, okay, how can I help you? But you have that yeah. as question like number five. Yeah. In this, why is it so, why is it like way at the end of the sequence versus like the first thing you're asking? So, ironically, I'm trying to slow down people's anger, not anger, but uh, kind of angst and hurry and necessity to go, I've got to help you. How can I help you? Um, Because the three principles we have around being more coach like, you've heard the behavior change, stay curious longer, rush to action and advice a bit slower. But the three principles that underlie that, and the, and the first one is going to be a bit controversial, is be lazy, be curious, be often. So being curious, we're kind of talking about, which is like, how do you manage your advice monster? How can questions really fuel a conversation that's driven by curiosity? Being often means 
just the insight that every interaction you have with somebody, not just in conversation, but even by email or text, can be a bit more coach-like because it means just asking some more questions rather than rushing to the action and the advice piece. But being lazy, God, that's the kind of most provocative here because, you know, the people who – work with you, Pat, who listen to this show, are people who are driven, ambitious people. They're not naturally wired to be lazy. And I'm not saying this is all about just, you know, <laughs> the, the fabled passive income goal of lying around in a hammock and drinking margaritas. Yeah. It's, But it is about understanding that sometimes you're rushed to jump in and fix it, solve it, and be the person who does all that for the other person. A, is exhausting for you. B, bottlenecks the situation potentially, and three, is disempowering for them. So for us, it's like let's get into a conversation with an assumption that you may not need any help from me other than this conversation because you may figure this all out by yourself. But if the, if the conversation goes down a certain path, um, it can then get very useful or really powerful to actually ask the question, you know, how can I help or more bluntly or sometimes more appropriately? So what do you want from me? Because there's a dynamic that we talk about in the book uh, called the drama triangle. And the drama triangle basically says, look, when things get dysfunctional and things are always subtly or not subtly dysfunctional, three different roles play out. There's the victim, the persecutor and the rescuer. So people people get that immediately, right? So the victim, the kind of complainy, whiny person, the, the benefit of playing that role is you get people trying to fix things for you all the time and you you take no responsibility for what's happening. Mm -hmm. But the disadvantage, of course, is you feel stuck and miserable and powerless. Then there's the persecutor, the kind of finger waggler, shouter or the micromanager. The advantage of that role is you feel in control and you feel superior. The the price you pay though is, is it's lonely and because you don't trust anybody you end up with a lot of work on your plate um, and you know, n nobody who's willing to go the extra mile for you and then the rescuer which sounds better than the other two but honestly it's just as dysfunctional as the other two it's all about the let me jump in let me fix it let me solve it give it to me you know the advantage is you kind of avoid conflict and you you kind of it's quite a controlling role in a subtle way the disadvantage is you're trying to do everybody else's work you're disempowering other people and in fact you you perpetuate the drama triangle because rescuers create victims and rescuers create persecutors and what we're trying to do is trying to shift people particularly away from the rescuer role, which is the role most people self-identify with. Mm -hmm. And the danger of leading in with it, well, how can I help, is you, that they tell you and then you feel obliged to help them like that and you're actually potentially in a dysfunctional relationship. What's advantageous about having a conversation and then at a certain point going, okay, so I understand what the real challenge is here for you. What do you want from me? makes for a much kind of more, if you like, adult to adult relationship, a clearer contract about what's being required. And sometimes they're going to say, I don't need anything from you. You've helped me figure it out. You're awesome. Which says you go, yes, I am awesome. Thank you very much. You know, be gone. <laughs> sometimes they go, I need you to do this. And then you get to say, well, I can't actually do that for you or I don't want to do that for you, but I could do this instead. So you get to have more of a negotiation about what's required. I think the other thing about the how can I help question that's comforting and why people ask first is because they want to know that you – like for me as a coach, I want to know that I have the answers like I was right. saying earlier. So I might ask that question, how can I help you in an email before a call? And right. that, you know, based on what you teach in the book is potentially very bad. Um, but I think the hard thing about coaching too is you just don't – like in the way that you teach it. With all these questions, you're gonna you, you don't know what those answers are gonna be until you're right there right. In, the, in the moment. So, coaching exactly. is scary. <laughs> you are right because what you're doing is you're trusting the conversation to unfold in a useful way, rather than showing up with a safety net of advice and information and content. You're much more kind of trusting yourself to be in the moment. You're trusting them that they can make great progress. And you're trusting that when you need to give advice or when it, when you're called on to have the content, you'll actually have that in a way that's useful and helpful for people. So it is a bit more of a risky place to be, but it can be much more powerful in terms of nurturing relationships that actually have impact. So let's say you have a conversation 
and you're asking the right questions mm-hmm. and you eventually find out what the real challenge is and you actually don't know how to solve that problem or yeah. what other questions to ask at that point. Yeah. How do you handle a situation like that? <laughs> That's a great question. So I, I try and live the lazy value there, be lazy. So mm-hmm. this, is a more, this is a more advanced level of skill around coaching because it takes a degree of self-awareness and courage to do this. But um, my three-part approach to this is notice it, blurt it, ask about it. <laughs> So I'll say things like, oh, you know, I'm in a conversation and I don't know if you ever had this, Pat, but moments where you're like, I have completely lost track of what the hell this conversation is about. <laughs> <laughs> it's happened in podcast interviews before. Yeah, yeah it, it's uh, Not something this one, where, like, where, where they seem to know what's going on here. And I'm like, I've, I've, I've lost track of who's involved. I might just, it might be just complex or I might have just got distracted and gazed out the window and then I'll come back going, I have no idea what's going on here. <laughs> so I'm going to say, Something like this. Wow. You know what, Pat? <laughs> I've just realized I'm, I'm getting completely lost in this conversation. So help me with this. What's the, what, what's the useful thing for, that I must know in this conversation? Mm-hmm. Or even just using one of the questions in the book. So I've got a bit lost in what's happening here. So just help me get grounded again. Out of all this stuff that's going on, what's the real challenge here for you? Or sometimes I'm like, I'm bored. You know, they're like they're going on and on and on, and I'm trying to do that good coaching thing of being an active listener and going, uh huh, mm hmm, yep, yeah, okay, yeah, nice, okay, right. yeah, uh huh, mm hmm. And part of me is like, God, this is so tedious. <laughs> what is what, what's going on here? I'm sort of colluding in a boring conversation. So if I'm feeling brave, and I, I'm not always like this, but I, I strive to hold myself to the standard. I'll go, you know what, I'm noticing that I'm actually kind of getting a bit distracted, a little, uh, honestly, a little bored by this conversation. Um, I'm just curious how it's working for you. And you know what, half the time, if not more, they're like, oh, yeah, I'm bored to death about this conversation. <laughs> I thought this is what you wanted me to tell you. And I'm like, well, let's, <laughs> let's get away from the thing that's boring us both and let's get into the real conversation. What do you think the real challenge is here for you? And so – um, but then there's that moment where they're like, they, they go, okay, so Michael, here's my real challenge. And I'm like, wow, that's a, that's a real challenge. And I, you know, there's not a, there's not an obvious answer. At least I can't see an obvious answer here, but what do you think? What's, what's your way forward now that you know that this is your obvious, this is the real challenge. So I'm just going to get them to keep doing the work. And if we find out the gap, then we go, right, so our, our, the work that needs to be done is for us to come up with some ideas on tackling this challenge. So how do we want to do that? Nice. So I'm like, it's all good. Like, m- my job is almost never to have the answer. My job is to know how I can help them get the answer. And sometimes that's research. Sometimes that's going to talk to somebody else. Sometimes that's go away and think about it for an hour and come back with your 10 best ideas. Sometimes it's a, should we just try and uh, brainstorm together and have some ideas together around how we might tackle this and then see which ones are interesting for us. But I'm, I, (laughs) you know, I, this is kind of a joke, but in in some ways I remain deliberately ignorant about all sorts of things so that I am not tempted to have the answer. Because honestly, when I think I've got the answer, I'm almost, (laughs) I'm almost always wrong. It's never really the answer. Mm -hmm. So I've been recording this other show of mine, Ask Pat, where I have a person come on who has a pain or a problem in their business, and I'm trying to coach them through the process using your process. Yeah. And I found that, yeah. you know, I, I actually have uh, all of the seven questions uh, written in front of me just so I have them always available to me. Nice. And I find that I still, even after, you know, and, and these come out weekly, so, you know, it's nice because it's kind of forcing me to use... Practice the, to have it, yeah. Yeah, the, the practice. But even still, like, I feel... I catch myself and listeners have all called me out on this. They're like, Pat, you're still teaching too much um, yeah. in, in some parts. Like how do we, this is maybe more of a, just a question for me to you, Michael, but I'm sure it pertains to other people. Like how do we break that habit of always wanting to just give and give and give advice? Because most of the people who are listening to this, that's what we do. And that's what we're good at. We, we blog, we podcast, mm-hmm. we create YouTube videos, but when you're in a one-on-one conversation in coaching, yep. how, how might you, break away from that a little easier yeah so um the lazy thing 
is to not internalize and go, okay, I'm just going to grip my teeth and clench my fists and try even harder to resist the advice piece. Um, it's to hold it lightly, know that this is a journey and you're going to you'll stumble a bit and a few steps back, a few mm -hmm. steps forward. My bet is that you're, you're already getting being masterful about asking questions and you're becoming more sensitive to noticing where you're teaching. So here's what I might do. I might say to the person, okay, look, I've got a bunch of information. Even before we start this conversation, hit, let me tell you what my goal is to, as a coach to you. It's to, to resist teaching as long as possible until we get to a point where my teaching is the only thing that's useful for you. So what I want you to do is help me. Anytime you feel like I'm leaping in with advice that's premature, I want you to slap me or call me on it and I'll pay you 20 bucks. Every time you, you, you catch me teaching you prematurely, mm -hmm. I'm going to charge myself 20 bucks. <laughs> and my bet is by the third, the third billing of 20 bucks in a call, you're going to be going, okay, I'm going to stop the advice piece here. <laughs> um, but, but ask for help. I mean, lean into this and go, help me be a better coach to you. Here's how I want to show up. Um, the other piece that could be useful here, Pat, and I don't know how you use it in your, in your coaching calls, but that last question in the book, the teaching question, which is what was most useful or most valuable for you here, the reason that question works so well at the end is for three reasons. The first is this. People don't often see the value in the conversation until they have a chance to reflect on the conversation. So by doing that, you're giving them the luxury of actually reflecting on what's just happened and extracting the value from it. Secondly, it gives you feedback. It actually helps you see what you're doing well and what you want to do more of next time. So in terms of building a habit and knowing that part of the habit is um, the reward, so your brain going, oh, that's good, I should do that again next time, and that question will help reinforce the behavior that's working. So there's that. And of course, more subtly, by asking what was most useful or most valuable for you about our conversation just now, you're framing this conversation as a useful, valuable conversation. So everybody thinks every coaching call with you is amazing and incredibly useful and value because you always make them articulate the value that they're getting from it. But there may be something in asking that question that will also help you reflect on what was most useful and valuable for you and help you point to when you stay curious and when you may have kind of let the advice wants to go a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'll give you one other tool. Um, and you may not know about this. You, you might, but uh, kind of secretly, we've released a, a, an iPhone app. It's called Ask More. Um, so A-S-K-M-O-R-E. It's kind of a little purple app with a little kind of A sign on it. And it's kind of, think of it as coaching meets Tinder. So it's a way that you can put down the names of the people in your life that you're trying to be more coach-like with. And after you've had a conversation with them, you get to swipe left if you gave them advice or swipe right if you ask questions. And it's a way of just tracking your behavior change with that person to see how more coach-like you can become with that person. I like that. What was the name of the app again? It's called Ask More. A S K M O R E. Ask More. No affiliation with Ask Pat, but <laughs> that's right. Very but similar, there we go. actually. There's a there's a nice alignment there. Yeah, there is. I, I do want to talk about that last question. Which, if you've listened to Ask Pat, anybody, that is the last question I ask, and it's always really helpful because I I I did that anyway on webinars. When I do mm -hmm. a webinar, I do that because it's a great way for everybody to see from each other. That's in a right. live setting like that, like, oh, I learned this and this and this. Um, I've noticed it at presentations before. All right, before I go and leave the stage here, uh, I want to hear from three people what was the most helpful thing you learned here today. Um, mm -hmm. And then on the podcast, it's great because it's like a great way for me to sum up the show. But it was something that was not in my mind to do in a one-on-one -on -one conversation because nobody else was around. Nobody else needed to see it. I figured that they would already know what was most useful. But I love the idea of having them share what was most helpful and actually i've noticed that in a lot of coaching calls i've had when i ask that question they have to spend some time to think about it but yeah. they always pull out the best things and they go okay so and naturally they do this because they're tasked to do something normally they go okay so my next action steps are going to be x y right. and z it's just it's such an incredible incredible powerful thing and so to finish off this episode everybody um i want you to answer that question about what we just talked about what was the most helpful 
for you. See what I did there? I did see what you did there. I like it. <laughs> so what I want you to do is go to smartpassiveincome.com slash session 325. So smartpassiveincome.com slash session 325. In the comments section there, just answer that question that Michael just posed. And that's the last question in the seven questions in the coaching habit, which is what was the most helpful for you? We will select, or I, I'll select 10 people at random a week from now to win a signed copy of Michael's book, The Coaching Habit. And that's how we'll distribute them. So thank you for setting that, uh, that up nicely for me, Michael. I appreciate that. That's so, perfect. Thank yeah. you. And I'm, 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 I'm looking at a pile of 10 books, which I'm about to sit down and sign and send them your way. So I'm excited to get the book out in the world. And, and well, Pat, let me ask you, what, uh, you know, we've had this good conversation. What was most useful or valuable for you in all of this? See, here we go again. You're asking the questions to me now. <laughs> so, I, I, I mean, the, the most helpful thing for me is just the fact that you're here and you're sharing this information with everybody, and hopefully everybody will get access to the book at some point. But for me in particular, it was more of the mindset of, you know, the advice um, monster. And yeah. I had it – was, it was, I mean – it's something I know I need to work on, but to hear from the author himself and, and to get some advice on how to tackle that uh, and, and be okay with it. And, and also just, again, reiteration of being lazy. I think I get so into wanting to help so much that I, I, I don't sit back and let the person talk as much as I likely should. So this has been really great. Uh, I love Michael, that. Thank you for well, that. What, what I'm really celebrating is your commitment to the behavior change because what we know about building habits is it, it just doesn't happen automatically. It doesn't happen overnight. It's repetition and a kind of commitment to a practice that allows you to really get this in your bones. And I love the fact that, you know, you, your commitment to this work and the fact that you're putting yourself out there on the podcast, Ask Pat, and showing people you're providing two levels of growth for them. The, the or, or maybe three levels of growth. You're providing the, the coaching to the person who's on the call so that they're, they're being helped. You're providing that wisdom and that experience to the people listening in. And at a meta level, you're role modeling this powerful approach to coaching. So, um, and then at that next level, you're like, I'm role modeling what it takes to build a habit here and to stay curious. So, you know, it's a really powerful contribution to the world. So thank you for that. Yeah, no, and it, stems from you uh so I, I appreciate that and the interesting thing is we haven't done this yet because the this version of ask pat is very new but we're going to bring back the people i've coached onto the show and see if they've taken That's action great. and so that it'll be really interesting to see you know had they and what worked what didn't and perhaps there's a second level of questions that are essentially the same questions but based on oh, yeah. where, where they're at now um, yeah, it's like you, you took action. That's fantastic. So what's the real challenge here for you now? You didn't take action. Fantastic. So what's the real challenge here for you in taking action? I mean, same question. Right. Wherever they are, you get to explore that in, in, in an interesting way. It could be like, uh, I'm so busy. I got the kids and I'm juggling this job and it's just no time. Okay, well, let's tackle that. How can I help you get more time? That's right. So it's like, so you didn't get to do it. What was the real challenge behind that? And what else and what else and what else? Okay, so knowing all of that, what's the real challenge to why you didn't take that on? Right. And the conversation shifts and it becomes interesting. So the action is I need to stop watching Netflix two hours a night <laughs> right. and exactly. read more of Michael's books. So there cool, we man. Go. Dude, thank you so much. Where can people go beyond the book, obviously? And we'll link to that in the show notes. And again, remember, smartpassiveincome.com slash session 325. Leave your comment. What was the most helpful thing for you in this episode? And we'll select somebody at random uh, or 10 people at random next week to win a signed copy. But where can uh, where else can people go to find more info from you, Michael? Yeah, so look, the, at thecoachinghabit.com is the book's website. So you can, there's, you know, a ton of downloads and videos and first two or three chapters of the book that people can get there. Um, we, we make our money through our organizational corporate-based training, and that's boxofcrayons.com, so people can check that out. And I've got a half-built personal website, michaelbungestania.com. There's not much there other than a ebook on how to be more courageous. And so if people want to check out that, they're welcome to do that as well. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Appreciate it, and thanks for all you're doing to help uh, all of us in the world. My pleasure. Thanks again, Pat. Wow, what an amazing conversation, Michael. Thank you so much for coming on, and I hope all of you had gotten as much value as I did uh, by listening to that as I did from uh, conducting that interview, and I'm just very excited because remember, if you go to smartpassiveincome.com slash session 325, you'll not only see the show notes, but you can leave a comment right now about what you learned, what was the most helpful thing you learned from this conversation we had today, 
and you'll be put into a random drawing to win one of 10 copies of The Coaching Habit signed by Michael himself. So go there one more time, smartpassiveincome.com slash session three, two, five. You'll even see an affiliate link for that book itself as well if you'd like to pick it up sooner than later. Um, but guys, thank you so much for listening in. I appreciate it. I hope you pick up the book really. I am i don't often go as hard to sell something um, just over and over and over again in the same episode, but really the principles and the questions and just the habits that I'm forming as a result of the coaching habit have been completely life-changing for me. And I'm very excited to just pay it forward and, and, and help you all figure out how to do this coaching thing too, because like I was talking about in the beginning of the show, we're all coaches in, in one aspect or another. And uh, in order to be the most helpful, we need to learn how to kind of sit back a little bit, be a little bit lazy, like Michael was talking about, and ask the right questions. And I'm also thinking about like some of the times I've been coached in the past, my favorite coaches are, you know, indeed the ones that just asked the right questions. So Michael, thank you so much again for coming on. I appreciate it. If you want to give him a shout out on Twitter, Box of Crayons is his handle because that's his company, at Box of Crayons. Let him know you listen to this. And uh, just give him a big thank you. Uh, and yeah, there you go. Smartpassiveincome.com slash session 325. That's your CTA, your call to action for today. And make sure if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the show because we got a lot of great content coming your way for sure. And more giveaways. And, you know, we're, we're trying to do more fun things together as a community. And speaking of community, if you haven't yet joined the Smart Passive Income community on Facebook, a large Facebook group with amazing people all there to help support each other. Smartpassiveincome.com slash community. All the links will be at smartpassiveincome.com slash session 325. Cheers, thanks so much, and I look forward to serving you next week. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Smart Passive Income Podcast at www.smartpassiveincome.com. Hey, if you're looking for a new podcast to add to your rotation, I've got one for you. It's called Dirty Money, and it's like a hybrid between a true crime and a business podcast. So hosts Jonathan Small and Dan Bova tell the tales of legendary scammers, con artists, and barely legal lowlifes who stop at nothing to rake in millions. Recent episodes include a man who looted $100 million from his own company. Crazy. Give it a listen. Head on over to Dirty Money right now on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or Stitcher.